Hello and welcome to the Mokana webinar on defending IoT devices against ransomware, viruses, and worms. My name is Kao Kandek. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Mokana, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have our CTO, Dean Weber, joining us, and he'll be presenting and providing information to give you background on these recent cyber attacks as well as major attacks that we've all heard of within the uh, within the both the industrial side of the industry as well as more uh, commercial and he'll be talking about how you can think about defending against them so whether you are a device manufacturer considering uh, building out IOT devices or building out your industrial IOT strategy or whether you're uh, a cybersecurity expert looking for ways to think about how to uh, join an ecosystem or work with other partners in the industry to build a stronger platform to defend against cyber attacks. Uh, we hope you get a lot out of this webinar. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Dean. Good day, everyone. Um, welcome to our presentation, and we'll get on with it. So again, I don't think I need to tell anybody on this call, but just for a review, you know, we're looking at a, at a quantum sea of change in terms of the numbers of computing devices and collecting devices that are going to be available uh, in the next few years. I mean, depending on who you listen to, the, the, the number is big, right? 50 billion, 100 billion, I've seen presentations up to 200 billion devices uh, writ large across the entire ecosystem of industrial and Internet of Things. Um, lots of money being spent in this space, and you know they're expecting great returns on the information that is going to be generated by this space, as well as the usefulness and connectivity of a lot of these devices will change the way that we live our lives. Um, so specifically to the industrial IoT, this is going to change the way that, that that information is processed in the industrial world. We're going to censor so many more things than are currently done, and we have a, a, a unique opportunity here in the green field to actually get it right, but we still have to address the brownfield environments that are going on that are going on uh, with the devices that already exist in the network. You know, we've kind of got a perfect storm here where um, between Stuxnet and Stuxnet variants, uh, we pretty much determined that there is no such thing as a protected device or network if it is connected to anything, or even if it's not connected to anything, if it's got to be updated or if it's got to be touched by external services, it is at risk. And then the other side of this is that the business folks want access to this information to make better di business decisions. So the perfect storm is those two things coming together. There's no such thing as, an, as a real air gap any longer. There's no such thing as a separation uh, of devices that can effectively prevent any external access. And we've got the business drivers that are saying we need access to the operational data so that we can make better business decisions. So bringing all those together, we're, we're looking at you know faster, better, uh, more effective decision-making processes and decision support systems with access to that information. But with that access comes a lot of danger. I mean, who would have thought that a bunch of DVRs could have brought down some fairly major services? I'm sure Brian Krebs didn't think about a, a 600 plus gigabyte per second DDoS attack on, on his home access capabilities. Um, I'm sure the Ukraine prior to Black Energy wasn't really thinking that a cyber attack from uh, near peer nation state allegedly launched software could actually impact you know thousands of users in the middle of a Ukraine winter, and you know that hasn't stopped. That's continued moving forward. We're seeing more and more. Um, activity in the smaller device range of industrial and the Internet of Things platforms as more and more people recognize that this is a, a fairly unprotected space. Okay, so the problem. <laughs> Again, that's a, this is something I think most people know about, but we'll, we'll reclassify this in, in terms of some buckets, right? 
Um, these are Gartner numbers. Um, we believe that they're fairly accurate, that you know, a, a large number of enterprise attacks are going to continue to involve IoT or industrial IoT devices. Uh, the device manufacturers are, are not able to stay up with these devices in terms of updating them to new attack vectors and new code vulnerabilities. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a, a large number of new vulnerabilities extended just this year. Um, and, a, and a large part of the budget that people are spending on cyber are going to have to be dedicated to try and solve for some of these problems. You know, uh, ransomware events are, are affecting business computers, but they're starting to involve, um, by association, the fact that this is also impacting things like healthcare, right? We saw ransomware affecting the business computers, but with the business computers engaged, there was no access to the medical devices that were associated with those business computers. So there's a, a downstream liability, if you will, uh, associated with those types of attacks. We've got a little delay in the slides going off. So, okay, uh, again, I'm sure that everybody is, is um, aware of some of these, but just to put things in a, in a timeline, you know, as industrial devices become more sophisticated and more computer oriented, less analog oriented, more digital oriented, we see a, an increasing level of, of attack on these devices, everything from um, you know, go back to Three Mile Island, that was a control systems failure. Go back to uh, the, the Dahmer incident in 2005, that was another control systems failure. And again, whether or not these were orchestrated as a function of, of direct malware is open to interpretation, but the short answer is we couldn't tell you whether it was or it wasn't, right? We can't even get attribution for a major attack like Black Energy 3 or follow-on attacks that have come as a result of Black Energy 3. Um, you know, the, the Stuxnet-like and Stuxnet-like variants that have come out as a result of opening that autonomous code door, if you will, have really, really changed the way that we need to think about security. You know, the, the fact is, is that we're, we're in, a, in nautical terms, we're in a stern chase. We are chasing the bad guys. The bad guys are out in front. They have only to be right once, where the good guys have to be right 100% of the times or risk being damaged. And again, this is, this is where things are really going to get interesting. Um, if you haven't kept up with the recent news, I would encourage you to go look at something called BrickerBot. Uh, BrickerBot was developed by you know, a person that considered himself a white hat that saw that after the Mirai and, and uh, correlated uh, attacks associated with Mirai that, you know, he wasn't seeing the industry moving fast enough, so he was trying to force the industry to look at how bad this could really be. BrickerBot is just that. It turns the device into a brick. It's created a new generation of denial of service called permanent denial of service, or PDOS. And those functions mean that the device becomes unusable. It is unrebootable, it is unfield repairable, and in many cases, it's unrepairable even by the manufacturer and has to be thrown away and replaced. These are the kinds of things that are gonna be happening going into the future. Um, you know, again, there, there is no correlation between the release of BrickerBot and the fact that the United States experienced a, um, <laughs> a somewhat consequential event of four major cities having a power outage on the same day. Whether or not there was something like BrickerBot involved, we can't tell because we don't have the logging and analysis and forensic systems in place on these devices to actually be able to capture enough data to make a determination whether there's a cyber attack involved or not. So with that kind of anonymity, you know, the bad guys are, are just rubbing their hands together. This is, this is something that that they are absolutely taking advantage of. You know, if they, if they see an opportunity to, um, for either economic gain or for political gain or for whatever the, the major cause and justification is, people are going to take advantage of these vulnerabilities and they are going to cause us no, uh, no end of, of issues associated with these devices failing after they've been put afield. Okay, 
pick. So what are our choices? Our choices are that you know we can try and apply the same tried and true or tried and untrue security mechanisms that we've been doing for IoT. Okay. So anyway, um, whether or not you know we can actually apply uh, technologies that we've developed for the IT security spaces to this new generation of devices is yet to be seen. Um, we at Mocana believe that that is probably not an appropriate way to try and address this problem. We've got to change the paradigm. So in this slide, we're really trying to give you a, a, a visualization of the difference between IT and OT or IT and IoT slash IIoT environments. And those are the Internet of Things, the Industrial Internet of Things, um, again, typically classifies a, a smaller, more potent device uh, with less processing power and more built-for-purpose capabilities. Um, whether or not there is a, a mechanism by which to uh, apply those types of technologies is, is in serious question. So by changing the paradigm, we need to build security into these devices at the manufacturing level. We need to embed security and as a result of security, create trust that is measurable and more importantly, demonstrable and transferable. At some point, we have to get ahead of this, of this chase. And, and again, the, the idea here is, is that the model that we have from a traditional IT perspective is not going to work very well in these small connected spaces. Okay, so what do I mean by trust? By trust, I'm talking about device trust. I'm talking about all the things that make a device operate, ranging from supply chain all the way through application execution. Uh, again, as the IoT and IIoT environments evolve, you're going to find that there's basically three components involved here. There's the device itself. I should say four. There's, there's the basic device itself, there's the gateway, and then there's whatever the analytics associated with the device, uh, whether that's a personal device and a home network or whether that's an industrial device and a, and a analytics platform associated with everything from predictive maintenance to new ways to use and evaluate data. Um, and then the fourth thing, of course, is the, the transport mechanisms between those devices, whether that's a dedicated network or whether that's a public internet uh, or many other mechanisms when you get into like military applications. So the idea is, is that on the device, there's a number of things that we need to be doing. We need to be building in some mechanism to associate the identity with the platform. We need to be creating a trust model that starts at power applied or as close to that as we can get in terms of trusted BIOS, trusted boot. We need to have a stronger, more effective update mechanism associated with devices, because hash and sign has gotten us in a lot of trouble with updates of late and is going to continue to be problematic as we move forward. We need to use more uh, cryptographic modeling in terms of how those update processes are operated. Um, and then trusted firmware, right? Again, back to the supply chain, making sure that the modifications to the platform have operated from manufacturer all the way through operation in only trusted format. Which brings us to the final measurement piece, which is trusted operation. And that needs to occur at each and every one of these levels. It needs to occur at the device level, it needs to occur at the gateway or collector level, and then ultimately it needs to also convey and be part of the analytics platform. What it boils down to is we need to create trustworthiness in order to validate that the data that these devices are generated, aggregated, and analyzing are all trustworthy. And if we don't get there, we're going to continue to struggle with is the data good or is it not? Is the decision that I'm making a good decision or a bad decision? Am I, I mean, you look at what Stuxnet did, Stuxnet basically hid uh, an illegal operation from the operators. So again, was the data good? No. Did the operator think the data was good? Yes, they did. And that was all part of the attack. And yes, it was a very, very sophisticated attack. But we're, we're seeing, now that that door is open, we're seeing lots more tradecraft 
ranging from cyber criminals all the way through near peer nation states that are doing exactly that. So we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of movement towards smaller, more autonomous code to create everything from from botnets all the way up to masking improper information and improperly seeding the analytics process to make the operator or the analyzer understand that what they think they're seeing is good when in reality it's not. So how do we make devices trustworthy? Well again, we've talked about some of these already. We need to, be, to build a mechanism by which we can create a secure boot architecture. Um, you know, Microsoft has gone a long ways to doing this in the IT space by tying themselves to a TPM. Uh, the concept of a trust anchor has been around a long time. 90% of all commercial computers today, workstations and servers, have TPMs in them. Are they used? In most cases, no, or they're used for very limited purpose. But that is a form of a trust anchor that we can garner a lot more information from and we can use as a root of trust to establish trustworthy computing and a trustworthy measurement of the platform. So secure boot is very important in, in how we create that. We have to have the, the device um, measured by the manufacturer or by the integrator or by the provider and that measurement has to be built on some form of trust anchor. That could be hardware, that could be software, that could be firmware. Um, Mocana believes that the way to start that is with a X509 certificate. Uh, and that certificate could sit in anything from a TPM to a Java card technology on a SIM or on, a, uh, on an SD micro or, or USB stick. From there, we've got to, from power applied to that basic platform, we need to validate that through a secure boot process or a trusted boot process, whereby we're checking not only the platform core sign, but we're also building out uh, additional capabilities beyond that into the boot architectures. The BIOS is trusted. The boot sequence is trusted, the boot loaders are trusted, the kernel load is trusted. All of those can be measured cryptographically and conveyed in some cryptographic means that can represent to the other consumers of the data that the data is good. The data was good when it was created and the data was good when it was transported. Secure update, we've already talked about a little bit. Again, this is where we go into uh, having to develop a mechanism by which we can further secure the update process. These devices are going to have to be updated in the field. They're not going to be um, installed and left alone for 20 or 30 or 40 years like the old brownfield devices in many of the industrial networks. We have to gain access to them. We have to be able to modify their operation. We have to be able to patch them. You know, one of the things that doesn't happen today in the industrial world is patching. And the reason it doesn't happen is because they don't have a patching mechanism associated with that. And then moving on up into secure operations, once you have all of that trust derived and you actually have data developed, then being able to transport that in a secure fashion uh, is, is absolutely as important. And then tying that trust chain into the overall trust stack. So not only is the device trustworthy, but the transport mechanism tied to the device is trustworthy. And then ultimately the means to convey that trustworthiness in terms of a cryptographic measurement, a hash or uh, other cryptographic means, X509 trust chaining, um, code signing, code validation, et cetera. Uh, all of those things come together to create a mechanism by which we can create the trust. And then by tying in the transport mechanisms, we can convey that trust to all the other connected devices, whether that's peer-to-peer -peer or, or uh, device to gateway or gateway to cloud. Okay, so the workflow to create such a beast is, is actually not all that difficult. I mean, it's, it's not simple or everybody be doing it, but it is not all that difficult. Um, by creating a trust chain, you know, again, we have the, the things that we've been talking about, the, the fact that we have to have some anchor for trust. We have to have some um, supply chain or core platform measurement that says this device was good at manufacture or this device was good at installation. And we have to make that as empirical as possible. The, the more important the data is, the more trust you have to put into it. The more trust you have to put into it, the stronger the trust anchor has to be. So if this is, um, you know, if this is a Fitbit watch, 
I mean, I was at a presentation yesterday where we were talking about a recent uh, court ruling where Fitbit data was successfully used in a prosecution of a capital crime where the operator, the owner of the Fitbit device was impelled to give up the Fitbit data because um, that data did not correspond with the information that he had given verbally to the investigators. And they used that as the basis for prosecution. These are the kind of things that we're going to be seeing going into the future. So establishing trustworthiness at the device level as built is going to be very important, not only to us as consumers, but also to us as operators and developers of solution sets. Trust anchors are, are the basis for which you can do that. Going up from there, again, the OEM piece of that is integrating those trust anchors into the platform. Um, you know, TPM is not an easy thing to integrate. It's got a lot of bells and whistles associated with it. We need to make that easier, and indeed, Mocana does have a solution for that where we provide an abstraction layer for all of those trust functions coming from the hardware in a standard API. Uh, one of the reasons why TPM 1.2 was not used more extensively was that basis. It was just too hard to figure out how to use effectively, and, and people weren't willing to put the effort in unless they were assured that they could use it effectively. And then moving up from uh, the OEM side into the, uh, the device and owner side, right? implementing these technologies in your environments, creating mechanisms by which trust can be evaluated, and more importantly, what you can do when you don't have trust. So again, using cryptographic means, we can create a trustworthy computing environment. We can make a top-level decision. Is the device trustworthy or is it? Is it not? It's a binary decision at that point. We're not chasing bad. We're not trying to compare against specific good. We are actually making a cryptographic representation that this device is known good to us at this level, which is basically the strength of the cryptography and the trust anchor, all the way through what do you do about it when it's not. And then ultimately that comes back into the provisioning mechanisms where you have to have an update capability, you have to have uh, an application output that can rely on and convey that trustworthiness so the outcomes of those applications can be validated by the consumers. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, on the stack here, but th this is what Mokana's stack looks like. If we can get it up. There it is. Okay. So uh, this is our stack. This is what we put together as a means to answer the question how to make a device trustworthy and then how to convey that trust to a consumer. Um, again, over on the left-hand side, you'll see the, the operating platform, starting with a root of trust, developing device and data integrity, uh, assuring confidentiality, and ultimately then providing a mechanism by which to transport uh, that through an authentication and authorization via non-repudiated mechanisms. Uh, in the center, you know, we've got all the things that go together to make these things happen. We've got uh, whatever the core hardware platform is, uh, again, in the, in the IoT slash IIoT space, that's a rather extensive list. Lots of operating systems, lots of permutations on operating systems, ranging on a wide number of, of compute platforms from embedded and system on chip and headless uh, microcontrollers all the way up through, you know, full-blown ARM architectures or Intel architectures in the, in the larger environments. And then alongside of that, any crypto acceleration that needs to be provided, whether that's application layer or hardware layer or transport layer, and again, that ranges everything from you know, embedded AESNI on an Intel chipset all the way out to an external crypto processor like a Cavium. And then the trust anchors themselves, and again, there's a, there's a broad mechanism by which trust anchors can be established. Uh, depending on the strength of need and depending on the availability of resources, Pretty much there's a trust anchor for just about everybody. At the very least, that should be some form of certificate-based uh, mechanism by which we can convey the trustworthiness through an endorsement and measurement process. And then going up from there are all the pieces that go together into that, right? So the abstraction layer, which is what takes out all of the functional pieces of the hardware security and provides them as a standard API so developers can use that effectively. Uh, and then, you know, above that, the, the trusted BIOS, trusted boot functions 
If one exists, like Microsoft's, it needs to be tied into the trust chain, because again, it's great that Microsoft does that, but the consumer is Microsoft. There, there's no mechanism by which to convey that to others. You, you assume that since Microsoft is telling you it's good, that it's good, and that the process that Microsoft is using is trustworthy. But again, that's not the whole platform. That's not the hardware. That's not the firmware. That is not the application space riding on and using the Microsoft operating functions. Uh, and then update, we've already talked a fair amount about Connectivity and transport, uh, again, all of your traditional mechanisms, SSL, SSH, DTLS, uh, IPsec, uh, and IPsec, Ike is changing, we'll talk about that just a little bit. Uh, and then whether it's wireless or wired and whether we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer using some form of group key and multicast protocols or whether we're talking about you know, an 802.11x supplicant mechanism that is tied into the trust stack. And then going up from there, into the authentication and non-repudiation mechanisms. Uh, Ike has changed substantially in recent years. Ike v2 and a lot of the new NIST guidance in terms of key entropy and key padding have made you know, the pre-post quantum world much more interesting. We're all concerned about where quantum is going to impact us from a cryptographic perspective. But again, governments and, and forward-leaning organizations are seeing a lot of work being done there. So we're, we're seeing a lot more work in, in what key entropy and, and key padding is going to look like in this going into post-quantum world. And then EAP is all the rest of the authentication protocols that exist from MS CHAP to uh, radius diameter. Over on the right-hand side of that, we've got the crypto containers and, again, mechanisms by which to provide for certificate interface for use by the crypto container, uh, either uh, OCSP SCEP or there's a new protocol called EST that's RFC 7030. If you haven't looked at it, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, RFC 7030 is enrollment over secure transport. It allows us to do SCEP-like processes over the wire or over the air in terms of being able to establish and manage and monitor certificates installed in remote devices. Okay, so how do these things snap together? Um, they snap together pretty well when you start talking about how the attack surfaces can be um, mediated or mitigated by these types of technologies where you can harden the device, you can harden the intermediaries, and then you can harden the analytics platforms. And more importantly, that each one of these platforms can convey and consume the trustworthy values of the devices that it's generating data from or to. Um, and there's some examples of how we do this here. Um, when it's talking about industrial control systems, that's a pretty straightforward mechanism of, of endpoint devices, sensors, actuators, gravitometers, flow meters, whatever that is. Uh, and then the intermediate services, um, where all of that data is brought together and transported and managed and then ultimately out to the, uh, the command and control or analytics platforms associated with that. And that's your, your ICS SCADA environment where you know, those devices can also be brought into a trustworthy measurement mechanism. And then ultimately, by creating that trust in each and every one of those architectures, uh, we can then leverage that for use of validating that the data that is transmitted is good. Speaking of ICS SCADA, um, again, this is a, a typical SCADA model where you would have a, a lot of different um, component pieces into the management, monitoring, maintenance, and operation of devices that are in the industrial frames. Um, SCADA is a, a, another unique beast in terms of the, the architectures were never built to be exposed to outside influence. So even though they are uh, in many cases, general purpose operating system and platform based, their functions are tied uh, very tightly into the actual industrial operations. So instead of you know, uh, an Office 365 application in the SCADA world, what you're tied to via a human machine interface is directly into the operation of those devices, the, the speed of the motor or the uh, activity and, and temperature and pressure and of, a, of a sensor in an operating environment. 
All of those things provide feedback and feedback loops associated with command and control. So those things are every bit as critical going on that we have to have um, built in. Okay, so uh, let's go. Let's go back. Go to the last one. There we go. Okay. Sorry, we've got a delay on the slides on our end. Um, okay, so what does this all look like when put into actual play? This is a representation of what GE is doing with Predicts, um, where there is a controller in the field that is generating not only operational data, but also has uh, management interfaces to the, in, the intermediate services where applications can interface with them. And then ultimately that information is taken all the way out to the edge for strong analytics and data manipulation that can support everything from predictive analytics to um, you know, uh, operational efficiencies. Um, so again, this is how you would tie all of this together from a, from a trust perspective. You'd build tr trust into the end device, you'd build trust into the intermediate architectures, and then you would build trust into the cloud architecture, and each one of those would have the means to consume and convey its own trustworthiness as well as those things that are communicating with it. Okay, and last but not least is the smart buildings, smart homes. This is again a unique area. These were the devices that were most heavily impacted by BrickerBot. Um, again, those devices typically have you know, standardized password architectures if they have a password at all. In many cases, an IP address is all that's needed to actually gain access to these devices. And of course, an IP address if it's on a network is discoverable in most cases. So being able to access the device and then being able to gain administrative control or to be able to uh, advance your privilege on the device is relatively straightforward. And then ultimately what you can do with that device depends on what kind of resources the device ultimately has. But again, if we don't build trustworthiness into these platforms, we're never going to be able to secure them. We're never going to be able to add enough security onto these low power, uh, low consumption, low CPU devices to actually do what we've tried to do in the IT world. We absolutely have to find another way to do this, and the Mulcana model is to build that trustworthiness and ability to develop and convey that trustworthiness directly into the devices at manufacture. Okay, Great. at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kao. Thanks, Dean. Um, and uh, this is Kao Kanebeck. I look after marketing here at Mulcana, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about Mokana, we are a, an embedded security software company. We've been around since about 2002, and we help uh, device manufacturers of every size, large industrial OEMs to IoT companies to cloud providers to secure their endpoints and their gateways and communications. So um, we are uh, we have a, a uh, we're FIPS 140-2 certified, have received a number of uh, awards in the space, and we secure everything from PLCs and controllers in power grids and factories to uh, devices and controllers, navigation and flight safety systems in aircraft and ruggedized vehicles to uh, um, networking uh, equipment uh, of every kind, access points and and, uh, and also set-top boxes. As we expand into having billions and billions of endpoints, we think there's nothing more important than we can do than uh, help to get these things secured. Um, if you have a question, you can submit that online via BrightTalk, uh, ask a question. There's just a link right below the presentation. Please click on that, submit a question online, and, uh, and also uh, please do uh, rate rate this, if you will, and let us know how we're doing. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them was, can, uh, can we share the deck? Absolutely, the deck will be shared, we'll follow up with you, it will also be posted with several other attachments um, online uh, with the webinar. Um, so the first question is, 
uh, for Dean, have you considered using blockchain to maintain and manage trust starting from the embedded device security? Uh, the short answer is no, um, and there's a reason behind that. I personally and we corporately do not believe today that blockchain is of sufficient strength to actually provide the autonomous device security that would be necessary um, if we were to consider blockchain. Uh, blockchain, don't get me wrong, blockchain's got some great use cases, but embedded security of, of autonomous uh, distributed devices is, is not one of them. Um, the reason being is that, well, actually there's a couple of reasons. Number one is the blockchain technology was really designed for things like Bitcoin, where we have a distributed ledger architecture, not a device architecture. Um, being able to actually develop trust measurements using blockchain would be very, very difficult. While blockchain could be used to identify the device in the network effectively, that doesn't solve for the rest of the problem. So if we're going to use crypto to do all of these, then we have to have a cryptographic engine on the device, and that cryptographic engine then becomes the core of trust developed on each and every platform, be that sensor or endpoint or gateway service or cloud. Okay, um, second question. We have uh, 70 chipsets, 30 RTOSs, operating systems that, we've, uh, that we support and integrated to. The question is, um, is there a way to understand what those solutions are? Uh, I guess meaning, um, you know, how, what do we specifically do with uh, semiconductor companies and uh, RTOS vendors? So, uh, again, the answer is yes, we have lists of the things that we support, but they are so fluid, you would find that unbelievable. The, no the reason the numbers are as big as they are is because new things are coming out all the time. Um, you know, the, the best thing I could do would be to say, uh, if you have a specific request or a target architecture that you're looking at in a OS, CPU, trust, and your combination, um, we can have a frank and open conversation about whether we have it, whether we have something that's close enough to it that we have a reasonable expectation that it will work, and then all we need to do is test it, or whether we actually need to port to a new environment. So again, in the, in the operating system world, there's a lot of oper operating system permutations. In the trust anchor world, that's increasing daily, and in the CPU world or CPU architecture world, you know, uh, everybody from ARM to Intel is creating new architectures almost on a monthly basis at this point. You're seeing new things coming out from not only the chip vendors themselves, but also the use cases associated with those chipsets and operating environments. A link to that question, um, can you talk a bit about how this, how the operating system uh, fits in with the, the CPU or chipset that we're integrated to and a secure element like TPM. How do those pieces work together with respect to our solution? Sure. So, I, I mean, at the, at, at the hardware engineering level, obviously, the, the CPU uh, trust anchor has to be engineered from either a manufacturer or a system developer. Um, you know, whether it's Infineon or Atmel or ST Micro or whether it's, uh, you know, a TE trust zone architecture from ARM or Trustonic or uh, Qualcomm, um, you know, the implementations vary widely from Renassus to, um, you know, a, another platform manufacturer like Dell. Um, you know, it really depends on the hardware architecture. And then adding in the operating environment that is built for purpose. I'll, I'll use, for example, the Dell Edge uh, Industrial Gateway 3000 and 5000 series. From Dell, that platform comes with three OSs, uh, standard Linux, Ubuntu Linux, Microsoft Windows and Core 16, which is the Ubuntu um, reduced uh, surface operating environment built for purpose for specific use cases in the industrial environments. Um, having a port to each one of those using a TPM architecture, which is in the 3000 and 5000, that you know, so that's a that's a relatively well built out, well thought out architecture of three basic function sets. Three OSs uh, using the same processor architecture and the same trust anchor. We have two of the three under our belt today and are working on the third. Great. Thanks, Dean. Uh, again, this uh, webinar will be viewable after the webinar, so if you arrived late, 
uh, you'll be able to, to watch it from the beginning. Um, and it should be available pretty shortly after. I, I would give it uh, uh, some amount of time, 15 minutes or something like that. That's incredible. That's great. And also you'll be able to download the presentation and other uh, information from Mokana and, uh, and also request a demo. Um, the, uh, if you do have any other questions, please do, please do submit them online via Ask a Question. There's one more here that we have. Uh, is there a way to examine my endpoints in my home to see if they're vulnerable? That's a tough one. Um, the, the short answer is no. Uh, I mean, there are tools that you can leverage um, from various tool manufacturers ranging from, you know, uh, an Nmap scan to a Qualys vulnerability scanner. The problem is, is that the scanner technologies, apart from just the basics of, of service and port response, and stealth or non-stealth modes um, really is the, the, the numbers of permutations just increase exponentially on a daily or weekly basis. Keeping up with all of the various configurations of all of the home or Nest type um, based devices and, and you know everything from Siri to Alexa, uh, you know it, it's just not possible to actually evaluate all of those devices from a, from a single source. What I would suggest is, is that you, know, you take responsibility for the devices that you enable in your home. You understand what it is they're running and how they're running it to the best of your ability or seek guidance from the manufacturer. And then ultimately, the one place that you do have a modicum of control is at your edge. So you have a cable modem or you have a, a, you know, a, a DSL wireless router from your ISP. Um, you know, those are the places where you, you can either use the native firewalling technologies from your ISP or you can add firewalling technologies from uh, third-party vendors. There's a lot of uh, home office, small office, uh, CPU-based, uh, hardware-based firewalls that you can take into consideration and configure them for default deny so that you're only allowing uh, in and out connections that you understand and approve. Great. Thank you, Dean. Um, the, uh, we do have some questions around, are there white papers? Yes, you can go to our website, and on our resources page, we have a lot of information, uh, some briefs, some explanations on how we do what we do, uh, data sheets on specific products, and you can also uh, visit us and request a demo uh, of, uh, of our system. We'd love to do that. Um, with that, we are nearly out of time here. And uh, oh, there's just one more question: Have we been validated under ICS? So we've been. Uh, we are FIPS 140-2, level one validated, and we have worked with various uh, manufacturers to help them uh, um, uh, validate, uh, get certified under DO 178 for the aerospace industry. And, uh, and there are a number of other compliance standards. I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that briefly. Sure. So uh, it, the, the short answer is we're software operating on a platform. Yes, we're a compile-in option to the target. Um, again, you can consider us a replacement for OpenSSL at its simplest form. Um, but the, the idea that there are certifications associated with either the operating platform or the systems development, as in the case of what Kao talked about with DO-178, that's an avionics systems level certification, and everybody contributes to it. So we have artifacts that we've contributed to all kinds of certifications in the industrial world, uh, 62443, 3-3, uh, Industry 4.0, et cetera, all of those are uh, well within our wheelhouse of contributing to, but those are not things that we can actually achieve certification on our own for. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dean. And uh, again, if you want, you can reach out to us via our website, call us. If you have a question, send us an email, uh, visit our site. And uh, we would love to get your feedback. Let us know, rate this presentation, and more importantly, let us know what you liked and what we can cover next time. So with that, we will conclude this webinar and have a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you very much.